speaking today is Dr. Berrios, is a board certified general surgeon with added qualifications in surgical critical care. He is health sciences clinical professor at surgery of surgery at the UC Irvine School of Medicine and is a practicing trauma surgeon and general surgeon. Dr. Berrios completed his training in surgical critical care at UCI in June of 2007 and subsequently joined UCI in July of the same year. He is the director of the Trauma Division Research Program, director of the Critical Care Core Lecture Series, serves as chair of the UCI School of Medicine Admission Committee, and is chair of the Organ Donor Council. Dr. Berrios' clinical research in trauma and critical care yes. issues includes the utility of thoracic CT imaging in trauma patients, anemia, traumatic brain injury, end-of-life issues, organ donation among minorities, geriatrics, and alcohol drug use among trauma patients. His work has been presented at numerous professional conferences and has been published in a number of peer-reviewed journals. Dr. Barrios is also a passionate humanitarian volunteer, and since 2011, he has participated in nine mission trips to date in Nicaragua, Peru, El Salvador, and Colombia throughout the International Medical Alliance organization. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, God, well, how do I find time to do that all? Um, Good morning, everybody. So uh, I know I'm here to help you guys answer and strategize and, and maybe dispel some myths because there are a lot out there. Um, so to give you broad brush strokes, as I mentioned, um, there's various and sundry things that um, we look at, right? And, and um, uh, the academics are the academics, the MCATs are the MCATs. Um, I can tell you is, uh, I mean, it all fits into the bigger picture. UCI prides itself on doing things holistically. So <clears throat> if our average GPA is about 3.7, then uh, you can imagine there's a lot of kids with a GPA above that. And there's a lot of kids with a GPA below that. Um, and then the same thing with the MCAT, our average is about 514, a lot of kids above that, a lot of kids below that. So don't, don't be terribly dismayed. Um, the one thing I tell you that I can tell you is eyebrows start to get raised below. Uh, yeah, I mean, almost making it impossible to be honest with you is, is, a 500 in their special circumstances for that. It's, you know, you know, 506, 507, 508. It's kind of like already the eyebrows start to get raised, but definitely a 500. And the one thing that, that can be troublesome for everybody I know is the cars section. Um, and, and again, it's not to say that we don't take kids below 125, but eyebrows start to get raised. Um, so just to give you general broad strokes there about what, you know, things UCI in particular looks at. And then there's the three things that you have a lot of control over, which is the activity section, right? Um, those are how much you did of what? And those are three big categories. One is research. And I saw something in the chat, uh, a lot of questions about research, the ins and outs of finding research at a community. Okay, yeah. Um, because... Um, UCI in particular, a lot of the UC schools pride themselves on wanting to create, you know, uh, physician scientists. And so does that necessarily mean you're really going to go out there and, and, and continue to do research? Maybe not. But at least if you can prove that you've done some of the basic things that go on, because a lot of kids do end up doing some research uh, during medical school. And so if you know how to play with the IRB and if you know how to write an abstract and if you know how, oh my God, statistics, please. I love it when kids know statistics because I grew up in a generation where that wasn't the case. Um, and so I shamelessly have my students do the statistics for us. Everybody wins, right? Because yes, you do some of the work and I do some of the work and then we all publish something and we all get our names on it and it, and it's, and it works out nicely, but um, so the point being that, that some demonstration that you do know how to do some good amount of research, does it have to be basic science? No. Does it have to be clinical? No. It is just the fact that you committed to something and you spent some time on it, uh, is, is helpful. And I have a whole big spiel on that, that I, that I won't waste our hour on, but, um, and then I can answer some questions. I'm sure I just created some, uh, the next one is clinical exposure, um, 
I don't, I tell people because some people misinterpret this as making you go through some hoops or pay your dues. That is really not the case at all. One is, are you already aware of what it takes to be a physician, what's going on at the bedside, how to deal sometimes with patients that are not going to do well or patients that are testing you personality wise. I mean, I'm a trauma surgeon. It just, it's like every day. Um, and so have you learned, do you know what you're getting yourself into? That's really the basic premise of it. And, 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 you know, test yourself and know what you're getting yourself into. Cause I don't want you to be two or three years into this in med school or, you know, God forbid, like into your residency and or career and then realize that you never really wanted to do this and you were forcing yourself because you're not doing anybody any good. So some semblance that you know what you're getting yourself into the popular things these days, EMT, not just the training, but actual EMT work or patient transport. Scribing is very popular. Medical assistant is very popular. Um, working in somebody's office. And, and again, it's not that you've done three or four smatterings of this and that over a few months each. It's whether you committed to something long-term and, and, and stuck to that experience because um, that's part of it, right? You're in it. If you're in it, you're in it for the long haul. And so your ability to commit to things long-term is nice to see on an application. And then the last thing is community service, right? Because slice it any which way you want. Medicine is still a very sacrificed field. And um, are you willing to give of yourself a little bit for no other good reason other than the fact that you're giving up yourself a little bit to somebody who needs a little something, right? Like one of the reasons that I do my medical mission work is that I tell people I have enough. And how, and how many people say that, right? So, but I have enough and I have enough to share and I have enough to give of myself. I, for one, am not a person who likes to give money. I like to give my time and my skill. And so that's what, that's how I give. And that's why I run around Central and South America and, you know, potentially get myself shot. But um, that's a whole nother story. Um, so anyways, those are the three big broad brush strokes. And then the last thing is, is you know, we had four was it 4,000 applications this year that were viable? Um, and, and so, and last year, for instance, I read 1,100 applications. And so, and by the way, UCI takes about 114 kids. So I call you guys kids because I have enough gray hair everywhere. Um, but how do I select you guys, right? And and so a lot of it is objective. A lot of you have that 3.7 and that 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 514 and, the, and enough activities and so how do I keep working my way from there? And a lot of that is like what we do personality wise, uh, because we try to pick people that are also a fit. You will find over time that each school, each specialty, each department, each whatever has its own personality and you tend to gravitate towards and pick people that are like you. Um, so there's a little bit of a subjective component, but that is what your personal statements and your secondaries are for. Like, like what is your thing you're most proud of? Uh, what is something you had to overcome or was a challenge? And which are the typical questions for UCI? And this is your chance to show me who you are and what insights you have and what drives you and, and what makes you different or unique. Um, because again, I, I have to whittle it down and it starts to become a little subjective. Is it fair? No, but is it overwhelming for us to try to figure out who's the right fit? Yes. Um, so there are two mistakes you make on your personal statement that I tell people, and I shamelessly share this all the time. Please do not do the laundry list. And by the laundry list, I mean, I did this and this and this and this and this, and that's why I'm ready for medical school. Don't care. I already know what you did. It's in the activity section. What I want to know is what insights you got out of it or, 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 or maybe what is different about you that you got something different out of it that's, than somebody else did. And, and so the insight, the bigger picture, that's what I'm looking for, um, not, not the laundry list. And then the other thing is, and I, and, I, and I specifically say it this way all the time, I know that your grandparents are special to you. But after reading almost a thousand applications of a sick grandparent with Alzheimer's or diabetes or a neurologic insult, um, they are not special to me. 
Um, and, and so please, please, please avoid this for yourself. Do not start off saying that you got motivated into medicine because of a sick grandparent. You can put it on later on in the application, one little sentence somewhere, like an, almost like an, oh, by the way, this was also consistent with my grandparent, but um, I can tell you it's an almost automatic turnoff um, because it, it, again, I'm looking for something unique. And if you start off with that, that way, you've already made yourself not unique. So it's harsh, um, but I'm here to give you pointers and that's a big pointer. So um, that being said, um, uh, so yeah. Trinity is going to start asking you the questions. I have a whole yeah. list of them here too that were submitted. Yeah. I remember from um, last time it was rapid fire. And then the other thing is yesterday we had the chancellor from UCLA and their um, undergraduate admission vice provost and people were asking a lot of questions. So some of them are from that. And his response was like, I'm not the person to ask. So I, I made a plug and I said, you guys should come tomorrow and then Dr. Lucero, who you know is speaking uh, in a couple of months. And so, um, yeah. So I always tell people is that this is your chance to ask questions. So type away, we have a list of questions that were submitted. So, and you could do it anonymously. Um, we don't tell Dr. Barrios who's asking the question. We're not taking notes. Um, so, you know, feel free to ask any questions you want in the Q&A and you could do it anonymously. So, you know, ask away and don't go, you know, don't hold back and then go ask your friends, neighbors, brothers, uncles, you know, that, you know, that hurt something. So like, you know, and he's, uh, and I work with a lot of trauma surgeons and ER docs and they're pretty straightforward. He doesn't have a, you know, he's giving you the information and he's giving you the time. So um, I think we're going to let uh, Trinity get started with some of the questions. And then what we do is we're going to group some of them that are in the Q&A because some of them do like repeat. And so we'll just ask it more co coincident, uh, co co coinc well, whatever. I mean. We package it a little bit better. Okay, so the first question was, what kind of extracurriculars make you stand out as an applicant? Uh, that's a really broad question. I will take almost anything. The one thing that I do prefer is something that's like a, um, a team activity, something where you're working with a group of people uh, because medicine is a team sport, if you will. And so very blatantly people who did some athletics during college stand out. Um, <clears throat> uh, but other than that, if you are part of a team that, that goes out and teaches kids how to play basketball, uh, or if you are a kid who goes out and builds habitat for humanity and works as a group, those are the things that are better um, in my opinion, because it shows a willingness to work as a team towards a goal. Um, so that's the preferred answer. That's not to say that if you do things individually, that's not okay. Uh, you know, things like, uh, and, the, and then the other, the, the other caveat is that it has to be consistent with who you are. Because again, if you picked five or six different activities and you spent a summer doing each or a winter break doing each, that's fine and dandy, but it wasn't a commitment long term, as I previously discussed. Um, and it and it should just and it, and it just becomes obvious that you're ticking off the boxes. So I prefer somebody who's doing something long term and something somebody who's doing something consistent uh, with who they are. And 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 I'll give you one favorite example from years ago. It was a girl who did um, I can't remember the name of the thing, but it's essentially. Um, uh, a camp for kids with autism uh, and they teach them how to ride horses and because it helps their motor skills and all that kind of uh, stuff um, and, and, and how to interact with another large existing being. Um, and, um, but the reason she did that and the reason she put that in there is that she had a sibling with autism. And so she wanted to do something because her sibling inspired her. And so that was consistent with her story. Um, you know, there are kids who are athletic and then they say, well, I wanted to 
coach underprivileged youth how to play basketball, which again, just a generic example, but 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 a true one. And and so that's kind of what we go for. And there's that saying, you know, see one, do one, teach one, right? Yeah. I mean, just is that consistent with who you are? And then and then you're like, yeah, again, if you're teaching kids or or something like that, that's you know, so awesome. Uh, another one is, do you recommend Calc 2 or Calc-based physics as a prerequisite? Oh, dear God. No, just check the, uh, I mean, each school has what they have. The only advice I have for you there is check and see what the prerequisites are for most of the schools. Like I was a geek in, in undergrad and I had a biochemistry, chemistry double major and I took Calc 2 and like at the end of it, I was like, yeah, that's about as far as my mind can wrap around this. Um, and, and do I use it today? No. Um, but, um, yeah, just be very aware of just go on their website. They'll tell you what their prerequisites are. Yeah. Some schools at the community college and the CSU level, they only teach one or the other. Uh, most likely they teach the calculus base, but also make sure your major biology majors don't need to take calculus based physics, but biochemistry, chemistry and anything in the engineering you have to take that so don't take one year of general physics and then take another year of calculus based physics for your major um, and then make sure you just check out assist.org or whatever your major school tells you you need to take because that's basically limited to that and some people don't have an option of taking non calculus based physics so yeah i know by the way i don't care where you take it I don't care if you took it in a two-year college, a four-year college. If you took it, you took it, you got a grade. Another question is, uh, do judgment tests like Casper weigh heavily on admissions? Is it used against you if you get a low score? Uh, the only thing we're using right now that's new and we're not even really sure how to use it, and I don't have the answer for the other schools yet, is what we call it. It's, it's something along those lines is the preview score. Um, which a lot of people are being encouraged to take now, um, which is essentially scenarios. And then you answer what you think is the appropriate response. And then that's weighed against what professionals think is the appropriate response. It is such a very, very, very complicated formula that we use overall that that is now becoming a tiny little bit of it. And so it's kind of like the personal statement, right? If, if your application, like when I'm previewing these things and I take a, a glance at your um, personal statements, it's like, if your application is really, really, really good, um, or if your application is really, really, really bad, there's nothing in the personal statement that's really going to sway my mind. Um, and, and those statements become like that niche group that's on the bubble. Um, and, and, and so that's where those things start to weigh in. If we're really struggling and we're really trying to determine and, and we need more pieces of information, then, then that might come into play. But if your application is otherwise really, really, really good and you happen to have a low score on that, it's, it's probably not even going to look at it. So. Uh, someone wants to know, does UCI look differently at students who took post back classes with a not so good undergrad GPA? Uh, we look at the final GPA. Uh, we look at trends in, in um, uh, GPA over years, right? If you had like a really bad freshman year and then worked your way up from there, but the damage was done and then you got close to a 4.0 on your post back, that, that's fine. Mind you, if your GPA is like 2.5, I probably can't help you too much. But um, but that being said, the, the point is, it's not just the GPA, it's the trend, it's the um, what you did during post-bac. So. Another person wants to know, what advice do you have for excelling in med school interviews? Uh, Zoom has changed everything, right? Because Zoom is a different skill. And as I was telling, because I actually just did mock interviews for surgery residency for some of the kids applying to 
surgery. Um, and I just kind of did a mini spiel on this, but, but it was, um, be personable practice in front of like, just pretend that that person's there. Somebody who like can, who can almost like they're in the room with the person as opposed to robotic or stiff or please. And all the other general things always still apply uh, is it don't, you know, try to make eye contact, if you will, to look at the screen. Don't look away from the screen. I had one person that I had to tell them, please stop looking away because every time they paused to think they did one of these and then they did it. And I was like, Oh, just, just, no, just look at me. Look at me. I'm here. Um, and, uh, be personable. It is a relax, relax. Don't be super, super, super stiff. I'm not looking for a robot. I'm looking for a human being. Um, and I'm looking for somebody with an appropriate sense of humor. I, I think, I don't know if you get the advice out there that you have to be super serious because, um, I just want to see somebody with a normal range of emotions that can just have a conversation. If you're awkward or shy or low volumed or looking around, that's the, those are, that's going to hurt you. And then, um, the other good thing about the other thing about the interview that I taught people is please, 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 um, do your homework on the place that you're applying to. It is, you know, a lot of places will straight up ask you, I straight up ask you, um, what do you do in your spare? <clears throat> Sorry, that's another question, um, which I'll get back to. Um, why UCI, right? Why do you want to come here? Other than it's obvious that you want to get into any med school anywhere ever, but <laughs> you have to pretend that UCI is like, you know, the cats, was it, was it the bee's knees, the cat's meow, whatever, um, that, that you want to go specifically there because they have X. And, and if you didn't go online and figure out what it is that that place is proud of, like UCI, for instance, you know, ultrasound simulation, uh, you know, global health, uh, research, like if you, if you like, uh, again, I'm painting broad brush strokes, but, but if you're not aware that that's a thing that we're looking for, then you didn't do your homework. And it's obvious to me that, that, you don't have any particular interest. So have that one in your back pocket because somebody's going to ask you why school X or somebody's going to say, do you have any questions for me? And if you don't have something that you can ask that's that's reasonable and shows that, that yes, you thought about this place in particular, that's going to hurt you. Oh, and then the last thing, the, the other thing going back to, um, um, you would be surprised how many people get... Um, caught up on the simple question, what is it that you do in your spare time that's just for you? And again, that goes to that, who are you? Uh, why are you different? What makes you special or interesting? Uh, and and, <laughs> and I, I can, I, I don't want, we have a lot of questions, so I'm not going to take up, but I have a really, really good story about somebody who just completely flubbed that question, right? And it was because it was, it had nothing to do with academics. It had nothing to do with science. It had nothing to do with medical school. It was essentially a question about, tell me about you. And so um, hurt themselves. Someone wants to know, are all applicants assessed equally? Uh, for example, if I say in my application that I'm interested in one area of medicine, will I be compared against people who have said they are a want to go into a different area of medicine? Nope. Global. I don't care where you want to go as long as you want to go somewhere where you help people in the end. Um, and, and that is a question that often gets asked. And I know I ask it is, is do you have any vision of where you want to go once it's all said and done or what specialty you might want to go into or what kind of setting you want to go into, whether it's urban or suburban or rural or like, and, and it, there is absolutely no right or wrong answer. The correct answer, however, is that it is obviously at least reasonably well thought out um, and, and that you have a reason for saying whatever it is that you say. I don't care if it's primary care. I don't care if it's neurosurgery. Um, because we need all kinds. So, and I'm not going to, I just don't have the logistics to figure out, uh, let me look at all the primary care kids. Let me look at all the general surgery kids. Let me look at all the psychiatry kids. I, that's not a thing. But also people change their mind. When did you decide you wanted to do trauma surgery, but where did no. you go in in medical school and how did you come out as trauma surgeon? Well, I'm a little bit of a, 
freak um, because um, I told my second grade teacher that I was going to be a surgeon uh, and I never wavered. I was never a cop or a policeman or an astronaut or anything. I, I went straight to, to the OR. But um, th uh, to be a little bit fair, I thought I was going to be a surgical oncologist. And then even in into residency, and then I realized over time that my personality did not fit that and my the way my mind works did not fit that. Um, and, and I started gravitating again, as I mentioned earlier, towards people that were like me personality wise, which tended to be trauma surgeons, very gregarious, very outgoing, uh, very think fast on your feet kind of people. Uh, number one, uh, and number two, it perfectly suits my underlying ADHD where I can love pivoting and doing a different thing at the drop of a hat. And none of my two days ever look the same and not everybody's like that, right? Some people like their days to be very organized and, and know exactly how it's going to go. And, and I, I don't recommend trauma surgery for you, or even for that matter, surgical oncology, because those people just they know how their patients, you know, what patients are scheduled and they know what they need to do. And they know if the CAT scan got ordered and that is just not the way my mind works. So uh, that, that, that seemingly innocent question really is, is um, goes towards a big piece of advice is you have to find something that fits your personality and that, that you like, and that, that fits the way your mind works. Somebody asked about how do you know what UCA School of Medicine does? And I put a link to your mission statement and a thing on there and your website. You know, they spend thousands of dollars on those websites. So. Yeah, please. They have websites for not just the School of Medicine, but for each and every department, for all of the specialty track programs that we have. You know, we have a uh, prime LC for Latino kid, not, well, you don't have to be a Latino kid, but you want to, you have to want to serve the Latino community. And we have one for lead ABC, which is for the African-American community. Um, and, and a couple of other programs coming in the future. Um, so again, you have to do some homework. I, and, and y'all know how to Google, but I want you to spend more than two Googles. I want you to spend some reasonable amount of time going through all the different websites, as you mentioned, because um, you'll 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 find delve delve a little bit because you know a, like a little superficial googling will will still become apparent. Trust me, the people that do this for a living, like myself and Dr. Osborne and and a few of the others that have been on the committee for for a long time, we can read the BS. We can read the superficiality. We can read the motivations. It's you'd be surprised. Yeah. The other thing, though, is that don't read blogs um, about finding out about the medical schools. Look on their websites because the blogs are not going to give you some secret or something. Yeah. All that information is there. Yeah. Well, and the blogs are anecdotal. Right. And what worked for one person happened to work for one person. It might be just that, you know, not, I don't want to say that you can get lucky, but that, that there might've been something that they say, well, I did this and that's how I got in. Well, I may have not even had anything to do with factoring in. So, so I agree with that completely. Um, the other question I was going to ask is, and this is what I ask everyone. I think I asked you before, everybody wants to know the secret sauce of how to stand out. Uh, what is the secret formula to get into UCI? Because everybody wants to know that. And, and uh, I, I already told you, it's a big multifactorial thing. It includes the activities. It includes having a personality. Um, you'd be surprised. I, I have, we have, I should say, because we do this. It's not just one person deciding. Um, there's a lot of people that decide along the decision-making tree. And so um, to get to the, to, to get to the final acceptance. And so, um, it's not arbitrarily based on one person such as myself. There are a lot of people involved. I screen some kids in and then they end up being, you know, like I said, an interpersonal skills problem and get rejected at the end because they had all the great stuff and looked great on paper, but interpersonal skills wise needed, needed a little work. Um, and, and so I have the luxury of not having to take my chance on those people and, and moving on to the next thing. So once you've done all the stuff that goes on paper, the next thing is, are you a person that, that is for other people and can prove that you're for other people and that you're not just in it for yourself? 
uh, or because your parents are telling you to. And so have some interpersonal skills is the final step. You cannot underestimate that enough, right? Because I can, I can get you to the application. I can get you to the application. I can get you to the interview. And if you flub the interview, and it's not just one interview, right? So it's the faculty interview, it's the student interview, it's the video interview. So you have multiple chances to make it good or make it bad. And, I, and you know, we have a saying on the committee, which is kind of funny, but kind of true is like, if you can't keep the crazy down for 30 minutes, like, how are you going to do it for four years of med school? There was a follow up on this. How do you get interpersonal skills? You either have them or you don't. Join a Toastmasters, work as part of a team, uh, learn how to speak in public. Uh, Student organization. Yeah, your personality is your personality. I cannot fix that, right? So uh, the, the person whose job I took over who retired, her one of her philosophies was, and this is why I'm reiterating it, is what you see is what you get. So if you reveal yourself somehow in either a really good way or a really bad way, what we're seeing during that time is what we're going to get. So uh, that's, uh, I, can't, I can't tell you how to have people skills. You either have people skills or you don't, or you can practice until you do, but your personality is your personality. Um, and I can't fix that. And if you divulge yourself, you, you know, that, that saying, like you show, you show me who you really are. Um, and, and again, it could be really good or it could be really bad. So it works both ways, but, uh, I, I there's no class for it. Like, you know, how do you take a personalities class? You, you, there's no such thing, but that being said, you know, how, learn how to, how do you learn how to engage with other people comfortably and in a nice way? You work as part of a team, you're in a soup kitchen, you're teaching kids how to play basketball. I mean, kids are very taxing and very trying. So if you can manage that without killing one of them, you're probably already halfway there. Um, and, and, and then how to speak in public. Uh, does it really matter? I mean, is it fair? Is it is because like, what if you want to be like, I tell people, what if you want to be a radiologist and work in a dark room by yourself? Or what if you want to be a pathologist and the only thing you're going to come across are either slides or dead people? Uh, probably doesn't matter, but uh, you're going to have to go through a lot of different rotations with a lot of different people and interact with a lot of different people. And if you can't handle that, I can't help you. And if I see that you're going to be one of those people that's going to have trouble, I'm probably going to pass you by. So just take that with a grain of salt. Another question was, does uh, or do non-STEM majors have a disadvantage, even if they are already completing all of the pre-med prerequisites? Don't care. Uh, we have a lot of political sci and history and, and an art major or two. Uh, um, some of those people are can be quite unique. So while traditionally we have the very, very large majority of kids taking some sort of STEM degree, um, it it's, doesn't really necessarily matter as long as you meet the prerequisites. So there's this rumor about people doing non-biology or non-STEM majors because it's going to increase their chances. Can you talk about why there is more STEM majors applying versus non-STEM majors and why their percentages differ? Yeah, so again, it's multifactorial, right? I already told you, I don't care what school you came from. I mean, it's as long as it's some reasonably accredited school, right? So, um, and I don't care really whether it's biology or biochemistry or chemistry or physics or, or art major philosophy or history or, uh, you know, as long as you've met your prerequisites. Now, do we recommend it? Yes, because it's really, really, really going to help you during your first and your second year because it's all basic science, right? It's all, you know, physiology and chemistry and, and all that microbiology and all that kind of stuff. So if you're comfortable with the topics, you're comfortable with the topics. So that's why most people tend to, to get some sort of STEM degree. Um, but uh, again, if you did well during your prerequisites because you took philosophy and then find yourself having to take a bio and a chem and a physics and a whatever separately, then that's perfectly fine. Don't, don't sweat that. Uh, 
How does UCI feel about second career applicants? Um, that's perfectly fine. Um, in fact, two years ago, we took a person who had been in the military and was actually a JAG, you know, like a lawyer in the military, um, and were a little bit on the older side because they'd had a reasonable career and, um, but their passion for why they pivoted um, is different. It, what was actually stood out and fascinated and, you know, they were underrepresented uh, and thought that that was the best that they could do. The med school out of was their reach and they had put that dream down, but then realized over time that that, that was still missing. I mean, it's just a good story. So, and, and their motivation for wanting to do it was good. And um, so that was compelling for us. Uh, now, so in other words, again, it's just part of the puzzle. It's neither here nor there. Now, if your reasoning for doing it is kind of like weird and like, oh, I'm just bored and I decided I didn't want to be a financier anymore on Wall Street and decided to do something different, it's kind of like, eh, is your motivation really where it needs to be? So again, it's not the fact that you did a second career that's going to help you or not. It's what was your motivation and did you have a good story for wanting to change and pivot? Another question is, are the application questions the same every year or do they change? Our questions have been the same for a long time. Um, uh, different schools have different questions. I'm sure some schools rotate them. I think we tried, UCI tries to be consistent and not have in mind what people were doing last year or this year. So we, we try to stick to the same questions. Another question was, does non-STEM research count or should we put non-STEM research on our application? Research is research. Uh, STEM probably a little preferred, but if you went out and you know you were a ecology major, and I'll give that as an example because it's a true story, and all of your research was out in the wetlands somewhere about you know what kind of food the whatever endangered bird eats, and you got yourself published, it's still research and the technique is the same, right? The research is research. And, and, and again, like whether it was STEM or not, um, did you know how to gather data? Did you know how to pose a question? Did you know how to analyze the data? Did you know how to write an abstract? Did you know how to write a manuscript? Those are all skills that translate no matter. I don't care if it's underwater basket weaving, right? Like is left-handed better than right-handed? Uh, the, the point is that that you know how to formulate a question and, and try to get to the answer. And so um, preferred maybe a little bit, yes. But <clears throat> the fact that you did it, don't not put it on there because it's not STEM. I mean, it's still research. I had a friend of mine who's been he, in his undergraduate and gap year. He's ended up living in a Chicago housing project doing a study on life expectancy and nutrition. And it was a sociology project. And he said, that's everybody in every medical school interview that he went on. That's the only thing they kept on asking him about what he did. Yeah. So, so because when I ask you the question, like, oh, I see you did this research on X. I don't ask you what you learned or, or what was the outcome or what was like, that's not the point for me. The point for me is, is what did you learn from that? Why was that a meaningful experience for you? So, and again, you'd be surprised because I got, it, well, two things, right? I do expect you to know the answer if I ask you that way. And some people will, because some people there's are sticklers on it, or, or you may have the luck of having done research on something that I'm interested in. So I'm going to ask you about it. And number two um, the other thing is, again, what I go back to of like the personality thing, like, what did you get out of it? What was your personal take on what you did and why that was significant or not? Um, and, and I'll be honest with you, for instance, I'll tell people during the interview too, is like, don't, and uh, going back to the basic STEM stuff, I did some basic science research as an attending when I first started at UCI, hated it. I will never do basic science research again. I'm, that's me. That's not you. That's me. I am very, very much driven now by outcomes and by clinical stuff. 
Uh, that's more my niche. And so I tell people, even if all of that did was show you that you weren't interested in basic science anymore and that you want to move on to something else or that you actually did do this first and then did something else that you put on, on your application and that's more your niche, that's actually kind of okay too. Like you don't really want to say like I just did to you because it's, you know, like, oh my God, I hated it. But, but um, you know, I learned some skills. Uh, I appreciate how Sometimes you have to do stuff that that gets the basic science proven before you can move on. But I know now no longer have the time or the energy to do that. And, and I've moved on to the next phase, which is the clinical stuff or the outcome stuff. It's a nicer way of saying it, but um, you still kind of threw in there the like, yeah, I got my basic science skills done and, but now I moved on. Uh, so, so there's ways of saying it, right? There's ways of like the original that I just said, I hated it. And then there's the, well, I learned from it, but I've moved on. Um, a lot of people are asking what kind of theme, I guess it goes back to Jubin's thing about the magic sauce or whatever. What kind of theme are you looking for in students' applications? And what is an example of a wow factor in an application? We kind of sort of talked about all those, right? team activities, sports activities, uh, you know, somebody who went off and did something like, you know, had kids who get off, went off and did AmeriCorps uh, or kids that like, uh, we had one kid that like picked up whatever the heck they were doing and moved to Greece when they were having like that big influx from the Middle East and, and worked at a camp for like six months. Uh, I mean, there's so many different things that are wow factors. <laughs> um that it's just hard to say that one thing but again i'm looking for a unique individual so anything that you do that makes you stand out i don't care what it is you know i had a kid who was a mountain ranger I, we had a kid who you know i don't know there's there's i, I just can't begin that you know we we had an olympic athlete we like so i mean these are sometimes a little bit exaggerated but that's why it's a wild wow factor um but i, I can't give you a specific answer. I mean, yeah, sure. Go, you know, become an Olympic, whatever in the next four years and then get back to me, but I'm you know, being facetious, but, um, so but they enjoyed what they were doing, right. As long as they enjoyed what they were doing and they were able to tell me why it was meaningful for them. Right. Because you'd be surprised we can pick it up. Like I said, there's the kid, like I did this and this and this and this, and it might be kind of sort of interesting, but you could tell they did it because either their parents forced them to do it or they just really couldn't give a good example of why they even got motivated to do that in the first place. Um, and I'm like, eh, okay, you're checking off boxes. Someone was wondering if I participate in research through my organization that I work at versus research at UCI, will that be frowned upon? Is one preferred over the other? Nope, not a thing. Uh, quite simply, right? I can't have everybody doing everything at UCI. Uh, and, and, you know, what if you're in Northern California? What if you're out of state? What if you're, uh, oh, which by the way, it brings me to another question, which I'm sure to come up. I don't care what state you're from, uh, to be honest with you. Um, you know, people have this thing like, oh, you know, UC doesn't take out of state schools. Don't care. Not a thing. Um, however, if 95% of my applicants are from California and, you know, a good chunk of them, I think like 80% plus or, you know, or 75% plus whatever are UC kids that are applying to the UC programs, then the odds are, then that's why our application looks like it's peppered with people from the other UC schools. It's just statistics, right? So if I only get 10% of kids applying from out of state, then... I'm going to take some of those, but they're going to represent a small portion, but it's not that we particularly weed out any one school or any one state or any. Yeah. And then the, the way you do research is as long as it's somewhere that is, you know, has an IRB believes in the scientific method because doing a research for, you know, people that I've done my research on something, it's very different than actually doing it, having people review it, approve it. Yeah. All yeah, of those way, in process. Yeah. And by the way, full disclosure in my other, 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 other spare time, I'm actually one of the chairs for the IRP at UCI. Um, so I've seen a little bit of, what is it that, was it the, 
what's the name of that commercial? I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. Um, so like that's why I say like if you can prove that you've had interactions with and know how to get through the IRB, that that's a marketing uh, notch on your belt. Oh, I see a really good question. Uh, I'll answer this one. Good morning. Uh, what would be the best way to make the most of post undergraduate gap years and besides a post back program, extra community college classes or some ways for you to redeem yourselves after? Yes. So let me tackle a couple of our, like, so it doesn't always have to be a post back. I've, I've given this advice before. Um, if it is something that is consistent with who you are, not because, oh, it's obvious that they're trying to, if you get a sec, a separate degree and then come back to us, whether it's a master's or whether it's an MPH, which is, I guess, a master's. But um, but the point being that it's consistent with you, who you are. If you did a lot of things on your application that's clearly public health related or social work related, and then you get an MPH, that's consistent with who you are. And that's one way to you know help your GPA while you're still trying to do something um, viable and consistent with your story. So that's one thing. It doesn't have to be just a post back. However, if you're really doing it because you got a C in chemistry and you're trying to improve that grade and you want to retake it, uh, and, and, uh, again, as well as a couple of other grades that you felt you could have gotten better and you just retaking them in a post back program, that's perfectly fine too. Um, and so then the other thing, yes, please, dear God, <clears throat> I'm actually doing a, um, uh, study right now on why all you kids are taking post back years and who's taking them and who's going to benefit from them because it's starting to get ridiculous. It went from, some kids doing it to the majority of kids doing it to some kids doing two years now. And I'm like, I'm going to start graduating people that are ready for retirement programs by the time they finish medical school at this pace. And so like, how do you have to take it? Number one, or number two, how do you do enough so that you don't take, have to take a gap year and, or two gap years or because it's starting to get out of hand and people are starting to get this advice. Well, if you don't do 10,000 hours of research and 10,000 hours of clinical, like you're not going to get in. And I'm like, eh, that's not necessarily true. We've actually retooled our formula and I can't tell you how we retooled our formula to, to take into account that at some point enough hours is enough hours and, 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 and doing more doesn't necessarily make it better. It just makes it more. Um, and so um but that being said, uh, if you're going to do it, and I know we kind of this year, we kind of noticed a little bit of kids that were a little thin on some of their activities because of COVID. And I get that. I think you're going to get a buy or the kids are getting a buy this year. I don't think they're going to get a buy very much longer because COVID's over in terms of not being able to go back in there and, and go to a group setting like a hospital or a clinic or whatever, whatever. Um, but like, like figure out for yourself, look at your application and go, have I had enough clinical exposure? Have I done enough community service? Um, have I done some research? And you don't necessarily have to be matriculated in some sort of campus to, to do some research. Like you can knock on people's doors until somebody says, yeah, here, I got some data, take a look at it. Um, but uh, the point being that, you know, we've had kids who are reapplicants, for instance, and then they took a gap year or well, not a gap year, essentially a forced year um, because they didn't get the first time around. And then they didn't, they put all the same thing on their application again. Uh, and, and they clearly didn't work on their application. And so we like to see kids that like did some introspection and took a good look at their application or got somebody to take a look at their application and tell them, this might be one of the reasons you didn't get in, like you didn't do enough of this or you didn't do enough of that, go out and do some of that. And, and went out and did that. And I like that for two reasons. One, perseverance, if that's really what you want. And then you went out and you stuck to it and, and you improved your application. And number two, you have introspection um, that you can reflect on, you know, what your strengths and your weaknesses are uh, and fix it. So that's what you want to do with your gap year. And, and, and uh, you know, it's funny because I hear these kids, well, like the first thing I did was go back 
pack through Europe to find myself for six months. And I'm like, next, you know, I, I can't help you find you. Uh, that's not what medical school is for. I, I, I don't, I can't do half baked. I need somebody who's baked um, because it's a Dr. lot of work. Dr. Barry, <laughs> I could, t- I could, no, I could tell you this though. Um, just been doing this for this year. Um, a lot of people are getting bad information about doing all these extra things. Um, I've this is this is one that's constantly come up, and I'm surprised it hasn't been asked yet, but I'm pretty sure it would. There's been posts that I've read that said, "Oh, you should go do nursing first and work for a couple of years, and then go do your prereqs and go to medical school." Which is, it's not necessary, and a lot of people are are doing that, or some people that are graduating doing an accelerated nursing program and then applying, and it's like, you know, so that's. Sorry. Yeah. So, and that goes back to that blog thing, right? That worked for that one person. Does that mean it's going to work for you? Not necessarily. And yeah. you're committing and you're committing to two or three or whatever years, even if it's accelerated. Uh, you know, we had a we had an orthopedic resident who came and talked about, you know, she was wanted to go pre-med, but she was forced into discouraged and went decided doing nursing. And, you know, she finished nursing. She went to Hopkins for nursing, finished. But it said it put her back 10 years oh my from, God. you know, to medical school. Because, well, once you get a, a job as a nurse, it takes you about 18 months just to get in it. And then you spend all this money. You got to work to pay off that, you know, $100,000. Um, you know, nursing part school is, is not cheap. And so what ends up happening, but she just said that she lost 10 years by doing that. And because she was given bad advice and a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, I, 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 that's a little bit too much. Yeah. <coughs> um, yeah. And so that's the, one of the, one of the big things that's happening, but a lot of these blogs, uh, you know, are coming up saying, oh, you should um, do all these extra stuff. I mean, I, I, we, we're doing inter- uh, leadership applications and I interviewed someone and they had all, I was like, why aren't you applying? And she's like, I'm going to take a three year gap here. And I'm like, because well, I need to do all this extra stuff. And I'm like, no, I think I think you'd be a strong applicant. Yeah, um, I think if anything, do well. What you just kind of suggested is please go to a professional, please. Um, and it doesn't necessarily again need to be someone from your school, but but stay away from the blogs. Yeah, they could be a little bit helpful, but take them with a huge grain of salt. I'd say like a big block of salt because. Those are anecdotal things, right? That's one person's personal experience of how it worked out for them, which may be unnecessary or unfounded, or they just got lucky, or their application was good. And no matter what, like some of the stuff they put down there didn't matter. Have somebody like the same thing for your personal statement. Have somebody else take a look at it. Join a peer support group, a pre-med society, a uh, uh, hit up your counselor at your school. Uh, hopefully you have a good counselor. I had a terrible counselor, but um, that's just the unfortunate look of the draw. But, um, but, but that's the point, you know, reach out to the professionals uh, that know what they're talking about. Uh, so those services should be reasonably free. They should be some phone calls uh, because you could end up wasting a lot of time or, or going down some rabbit hole uh that doesn't matter uh we have a couple questions about letters of recommendation Ah, um yes how many letters of recommendation does uci ask for (coughs) to ask for those letters uh three minimum usually about five maximum if you hit six and this it starts to become like well aren't they a little overachiever um so i would recommend four or five Uh, but who are you getting those letters from is also a mistake that people make. Please do not get them all from your professors in a class because you're going to get what I call the, uh, I have a whole lecture on this, by the way, you're going to get what I call the um, Boy Scout letter. They were clean and honest and reliable and walked little ladies across the street and came to my office hours and did great in my class. Fine, dandy. 
But what I'm also looking for are letters if you went out and you were an MA or you were a scribe or you did do some research with somebody or you did build a habitat for humanity or you did work at a food kitchen, get letters from these people, right? Because it proves that you did what you say you did. And number two, these are things that are from that require interpersonal skills. And these people can say and, and put in their letter, like, oh my God, they were like awesome. They were fun to work with um, as well as reliable and blah, blah, blah. And when you are going to ask for a letter, do two things. Make sure that the person is enthusiastic about doing it <clears throat> because if they say, huh, okay, fine, I'll write you a letter. Uh, you know, accidentally forget to, to get a letter from them because they're going to write you the Boy Scout letter and they're not going to be enthusiastic about it. And then the other thing is please um, invite to give your CV and or your personal statement if it is ready, because what happens with those letters, right? That person can say, and even from a basic science professor, occasionally they go out of their way and they say, hey, listen, this kid was awesome. And they came to my class and they did my office hours and they asked good questions, blah, blah, blah. But then they still pepper it with, and I know that above and beyond that, they worked with autism kids and with horses and that they worked in somebody's busy underrepresented office. Uh, and, and so that this person obviously knows who you are and knows who you are as, as a, as a well-rounded individual. Um, and so uh, those are the, the pointers for getting letters of recommendation. I see something about dual programs um fine dandy uh the mph the mba i know plenty of kids that go through it um if it's consistent with who you are and who you want to be i personally recommend md mba medicine has been wrested away from the doctors by bean counters and if we can put ourselves back at the table by having md mbas i highly encourage it but as long as it's consistent with who you are and why you want to do it <clears throat> um i don't know much about the prerequisites other than I, I do know that the person who does the NBMDA is an awesome guy and is happy to answer questions for you. I'm sure if you go to the website, his name will be there. It's, it's um, Kyle Parades um, threw him under the wheels of the bus. I don't know who runs the MD MPH program, the MD uh, dual degree for like MD MPH is super, super rigorous. So um Th those requirements are completely different and you can go and take a look at those. But again, I just, if you're doing it, do it for the right reasons and have a good answer for why you specifically want to do it. We have someone in two weeks or three weeks who did an MD MBA at UCI and he's an anesthesiology <laughs> attending at UCLA right now. So on the 19th. Yeah, there you go. Check it out. Get Another asking. question that will come up. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Um, do you... You said that you didn't necessarily care about where people come from when, when applying, but do you care if people intend to stay in California after graduating? I don't want you to. Uh, we got plenty of kids trying to stay at our own institutions and and uh, we actually encourage diversity. I don't want inbreeding. So I don't care if you're going to go back to the East Coast when you're done. Just not a thing. Another question was, you mentioned earlier that it's easier to, it's easy to pick out when people sound like they're checking off boxes. Could you uh, explain how you can tell when people are doing that in their application? Yeah, sure. But if you can give me just one quick minute and I will be right back.
All right. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, it's just a matter of the passion that goes into it, right? It's just, uh, like I said, um, red flags, a bunch of different little activities for short periods of time, no letters from those people that you did those activities with. You know, you say the the same generic things of like, oh, I just, <clears throat> oh, oh, so, so here we go. Good example. Um, you essentially start off with the, in order for me to gain more experience about how the homeless have to deal with whatever, I decided to work at a homeless shelter. Okay, you're checking off the boxes. Come, come on. Um, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, I walk past these people every day and I, my heart was moved and I decided it, you know, it's, it's, um, and, and it's, and it's really funny because they almost don't even stray from the formula, right? They list four different activities and each one starts with, and then in order for me to become more like whatever, I decided to do this and I'm like, eh, okay, yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, so, so trust me, it, it's, it's obvious. <clears throat> The question was, what research opportunities does UCI Medical School have for its medical students? You name it, they've, in fact, they even have a whole department that's dedicated towards helping kids find research opportunities. It's called the ICTS, the Institution for Clinical Translational uh, Research, and, and they link kids up with things. And then the other thing is, too, is like if you go and you knock on anybody's door, I will tell you, you will get some no's, but the point being that there are, there are thousands of clinical people as well as basic science people that you can knock on their door and say, you know, I heard that you were interested in this particular field <laughs> or this particular type of research. Can I come help you? You're going to get some no's, but you can, uh, it takes us one. Yes. Um, and, and like I said, there are specific services out there to help connect the kids up with with who they think and actually provide sometimes a you know a couple hundred bucks of research uh, opportunities or statistics opportunities and so the infrastructure is there to help you uh, another question was it's a research certain... university so there is they want you to do research yeah, and exactly. it. I, I had a friend who went to UCI and was doing the research and the person was down in San Diego and they let him do the research with that person. So, Yeah, because data is data, right? And you'd be surprised how many people have just data sitting proverbially on their desktop uh, waiting for somebody to be able to pick it up and do stats on it or, or finish cleaning it up. And, and, and like, that's how I do a lot of the research with my kids, right? And because I don't have the time to do the basic stuff uh and 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 they need to learn how to do the basic stuff so everybody wins this is a really quick one people want to know if you don't know what specialty you want to go to before you apply is that disadvantage and when you have <laughs> to decide what you want to do not a thing <clears throat> uh absolutely you don't have to know what you're doing some kids answer that you know some kids are like well i think this but i don't know or or I really haven't thought that far ahead yet. I just know that I want to help people. And, and um, you know, and, and like you said, like half the kids are going to change their mind anyways. Um, so it doesn't really matter. I mean, it makes for a nice conversation piece, but, um, you know, where some kids tell me, well, my experience has been primary care. My experience has been the ED or my experience has been OBGYN or whatever. And so that might be an early thing that I'm interested in, but I could be open to other things. Yeah, one of the people that's on our board of advisors, she's a first year. And every single time I talk to her, she has a different special. Yeah. yeah. Like, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do this. I want to do that. It's like it changes. And that's what it's supposed to be. You discover. I mean, yeah. if you knew what you wanted to do, I mean, Dr. Barrios is the outlier. Um, that he <laughs> wanted, He's the outlier, but most people, um, change it and even you change too you want to be a surgeon and yeah and you're doing i mean though it's, it's a very different type of surgery so yeah than trauma. No, i mean I, I, we had a kid a couple of years ago that and, and i'm sorry she 
we lost her to USC, but she was gung ho. All her research, everything was about OBGYN. And then she took the um, general surgery rotation and she was like, oh, no, I'm going to be a general surgeon. And she completely pivoted in the middle of her third year. But you know what? She's perfectly fine. In fact, again, the fact that her research hadn't really not surgical, but was OBGYN didn't matter. I mean, she could put a good spin on it. And, and, uh, and again, she was able to reiterate that like, well, the skills are translatable. So yes, I know it was OBGYN, but, but I saw the light and, and she's at USC now. So, I mean, not shabby. Uh, another question about research was, does it hurt to not have publications along with your research experience? Eh, not really. It gets you an extra point. Might not necessarily mean anything. Uh, whether you have some good amount of research or not is, and, and a letter from that person is, is will get you most of the points there. So yeah, could you get yourself an extra point if you actually got the publication? Yeah, but is it a, is it a killer? No. A lot of research don't get published. They, yeah, they especially the basic block. science stuff. It takes years and years and years to get published. So it's not, that's why we don't necessarily expect you to get a publication, especially if most of the work you've been doing is basic science. Another question is, if I have done research to get all the products and the MCAT and to dwell on them, would having nothing in the activity sections bring me down as an applicant? I can tell you that right now. That's what we, that's, let's go back to the first five minutes of the presentation. Like, and again, it's not that I'm making you go through hoops because I love making you go through hoops. It's because I want to know that you know how to give of yourself, that you know what you're getting yourself into, that you know how basic science works and, and how important is research is in that. So, yeah. A couple of questions have come up about how UCI handles students with physical disabilities and or learning disabilities and if that's a disadvantage and at what point uh, will they still be accepted? Yeah. Well, first of all, that's California law. Well, that's federal law, right? I cannot discriminate and take points away from you for having a learning and or physical disability as long as you are capable of performing the work. <clears throat> uh, that is required. So, I mean, you know, we accommodate for physical disabilities, obviously. I mean, we have to, and, and, and we gladly do it. Uh, and the learning disabilities like dyslexia is not a terribly uncommon thing. Um, I mean, for God's ADHD. Sake. Yeah. It, well, yeah. Don't <laughs> um, and uh, Every, I know a lot of doctors that have ADHD and they're totally fine. Oh yeah. No, dude, you should see me. 10 minutes into walk, walking around with me, you'd be like, oh, dude, he needs to be medicated. Um, so, uh, but um, we do accommodate for all of that, right? We, we can't discriminate. We can't take points off as long as there's reasonable accommodation. We, we do have, we've had students in wheelchairs and we've had students um, who are given extra time on their, on their exams because of learning disabilities, you know, so. Uh, we're don't. doing a talk next spring about disabilities and we're going to have a PMNR doc who's in a wheelchair and hospitalist who's deaf and uh, another one who is um, has uh, um, uh, in a wheelchair and then uh, uh, the third one is um, doesn't have uh, an arm. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, so, he's a radiologist, but he's, right. well, but yeah, I mean, there, there's what, 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 why would I care? Right. So, um, and we had one student running around guys a couple of years ago. So it was, I remember it was before COVID and he was on the trauma rotation and he had um, uh, a sign language interpreter for him because he was deaf and, and uh, was allowed to have that, that accommodation. A lot of people are asking uh, just in general how the application system works, like how many people review applications, do you send secondaries to everybody, um, how many people look at them, all that stuff. Yeah, so we don't necessarily send secondaries to everybody. Um, if their application is not viable, their application is not viable. I do know, unfortunately, some schools that 
because they can charge for the secondaries will send out the secondaries and that can get expensive for you and it's even though they really don't have much of an intention of uh taking that application seriously which is unfortunate i cannot name any names but but that practice is out there um and then we do have <clears throat> our committees about i want to say 10 people um and, and actually part of that this year stems from the fact that last year <laughs> out of the 4,000 applications that were viable, I read 1,000 or 1,100 of them personally. So I was responsible for 25% of the decision-making process and, and getting screened. And, and in order to make that not a num number one, I almost needed a therapist after that. And number two, um, we don't want to make it in such a way that that one specific personality is is making all of those decisions so we opened it up to more people and i'm really probably going to get to about three or four hundred this year and then the rest of it is going to be divvied up um and and so yes unfortunately um there is a step at which people like me decide that you're going to get interviewed or not um and uh, I, when it comes to that step, I do have the final say. It's why I was hired. Uh, I like to be as fair as I can about it. But again, remember, out of 4,000 people, I have to whittle it down to about 500-ish interviews. So um, there's a lot of, you know, emotional gut-wrenching, do I want to let this kid in or not type of thing. And, and if I say no, it, it does stop there. Um, if I say yes, then there's the interview phase. And then there is a committee phase of, of that is clinical and non-clinical faculty, as well as some students um, to help us. So it becomes a multi-person thing. So that's why I try to, you know, I, I reinforce that for the large majority of, if you're getting through the process, it is more than one person deciding. It's not just one person deciding. So, Dr. Barrios, oh. we're gonna we're gonna ask this again because I think you've said it like three times, but we just want to beat it again one more time. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, "What activities would you recommend that would attract your eye and give you twinkle in your eyes?" Yeah, long term commitment, something consistent with who you are something that involves a lot of interaction with other people and again whether that's a sport or teaching kids how to play sports or teaching kids how to do whatever uh working as part of a group those are the things that i highly reinforce because activities that you do by yourself let me tell you a no now i'm just going to go into the fun portion but i'm just going to stream of consciousness for you i had a kid that got through the interview process and, and, and I asked the fateful question, what do you do in your spare time that um, is just for you? And they said, oh, this sounds funny. Oh, by the way, if you start off a sentence with this might sound funny, don't say it, just don't. Um, so they said, this might sound funny, but I love to tutor. Okay, no, I know you love to tutor because you put it on your application already. But never, so I, I, I tried to give them a second chance. And I said, okay, the school blew up. You cannot tutor anybody. What do you do in your spare time? <gasps> oh, my friends and I like to blog about some fashions that we go shopping and we take pictures and we show each other. And I'm like, okay, you know what? Okay, that's super cute. But again, what you're telling me is that in your spare time, you put a computer between yourself and the real world. So is that interpersonal skills? Is that going out there and doing something for somebody? Is that working as a group and learning how to interact normally with other people? No. So I cannot reinforce enough. Go out there and do stuff that makes you work with other people. Because, and again, that question of like, how do you become a better interpersonal skills? That's how you do it. You go out there and you do it. Uh, and, and if it's painful for you to do it, and no matter how hard you try, you can't do it you might not want to go into a people person profession. Yeah. So I actually, somebody asked me, asked that another thing was they're saying that they have this research opportunity to translate 
um, things on social media for a human <coughs> rights organization, is that something that is uh, that is worthy? I don't uh, know. If it's worthy to you, then it's worthy. It, yeah, I mean, if you get something out of it, then yeah, you put put it in your research or put it under volunteer or put it under something. But but have a good reason for why you wanted to do that um, or what you think the meaningfulness behind that is. And if you're legitimate about it, you're legitimate about it and do it. Like, A quick follow up to the um, like admissions process. Uh, someone was asking if you send letters of like progress throughout the application. No, the only time you're going to either hear and they and they get batched, so yeah. it may take a while. Is and even if you got accepted, it might take a while, and they're going to get batched. Uh, and the person who's responsible for calling our students will do that. Um, you, you will eventually get a, you won't get a, like, still working on it, um, uh, because, I mean, we, we just can't, there's just too much of that, um, and, and, and we will, and if you call the institution, all you're going to get is a vague, yeah, you're still in the pile, so it doesn't behoove you to call, and actually, by the way, mistakes to be made, um, don't keep calling, don't, don't keep sending updates, I tell people you kind of like get one shot at it because I know there's like the letter of intent and all that kind of stuff. Don't do that more than once because now you actually have red flagged yourself as high maintenance, uh, and 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 I'm and, and it's going to be counter. I can guarantee you it's going to be counterproductive. Um, and and I'll tell you something which was a great horrible mistake on my part, and and early on in the process like like when I started doing this like seven or eight years ago um, and, and a, a kid who started doing that just sent an update and sent a, oh, by the way, I'm still interested. And oh, by the way, I've been doing this now. And after the second or third one of those letters, and I just kept trying to say, thank you for the update, you know, um, and they sent another one. I went to forward it um, to one of my colleagues and I put high maintenance question mark, but I unfortunately CC'd the kid. Uh, and, and so, but doubled down. So talk about like things not to do, double down. And instead of getting the hint, uh, actually wrote back, oh my God, I didn't mean to come across that way. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that I'm really super interested. And I'm like, oh, do you see what you're doing right there? That is, is what's gonna keep me from wanting you. Um, so. Uh, yeah, and, and and, and I, I, the only thing is, I would add this is that, like, uh, this is just something to add. Like, you're a surgeon. You what work forty to fifty hours operating on a good week uh, on a good week, and the rest of it, all the stuff <laughs> that you're doing, yes, is part of your job. Everything else, but you know that very tight schedule, and your staff is, you don't have a big staff, and so doing these things creates more work for people and it's counterproductive to you and this is uh, every single person has said this is like don't you know you don't do it. you're speaking through your application sending extra emails and um sending extra emails and all of these things it's it creates more work for somebody else that you know, speaks through your application, not through the seven emails that you send with your updates. Right. And that's and like why I said, if you're really rejected, important. Yeah. yeah. Like, yes, absolutely true. And like I said, if like you get the one shot at it, right, you get the one update or you get the one letter of intent. Um, and But more than that is is becomes a no, no. And trust me, if we reject you, you're going to get that letter. If you get accepted, you're going to get that phone call. Um, if you're on some sort of wait list, whether it's being screened in for interview or from the interview to the we accept you process, if no news is good news. Uh, uh, so, so, and it's a rolling process, right? Like some of our kids didn't find out they were getting in until like April of, you know, of, of this last year for July or August. Um, so you just have to, much like in medicine, learn to be patient. Oh, I have a friend who got into your medical school literally a week before school started. Yeah, because now you're allowed to withdraw. Um, I mean, the process is designed for to help the student as much as possible. You're allowed to withdraw like 
up until you get the white coat. Um, and so um, there, there is that possibility of, of getting picked up at the last minute just when you think it's all over or kids that got accepted somewhere else, but really, really, really wanted that one school. If they got into that one school, finally will drop the other school and then that other school will have a position available. So, I mean, it's a scramble sometimes. Another common thread of questions, which we get a lot is how soon should I send my secondaries after I receive them? And also uh, applying early too. Yeah, immediately. I will tell you sometimes in the computer system, it's just first come first serve, right? So have everything available uh, the, the, the day that it opens and it'll put you higher up on the queue because I can tell you towards the end, we are, it's brutal. It's, I would say it's hunger games, but um, uh, it, 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 we are particularly brutal towards the end because we're down to the last few um you know spots and so you act you have to shine extra almost i mean i mean we kind of give ourselves like at the beginning of the year we're we're we allow past the screening phase like two or three kids for every 10 that we read and towards the end we're down to like one kid and 10 for every application that we read so early bird gets the worm early bird gets the worm A more specific one was, is it assumed to, is it correct to assume that if a secondary invite is not received by the end of November, uh, I won't get in? Yeah, you're, you're, if you're not getting secondaries, you're, it's pretty much done. Uh, yeah. And if you're going to reapply, what should you do? Uh, spend your gap, your forced gap year uh, at, you know in a clinical setting, uh, building a habitat for humanity. I know I keep saying that because it's just a common thing, but, um, uh, don't resubmit that. the same application. Oh yes. Dear God, please don't just take the same application to resubmit it. Cause that's just an automatic, like, well, they didn't get the hint, right. There was no introspection. There was no, uh, working on, on the perceived weaknesses in the application. And that's again, the important part of like going to somebody with some, reasonable amount of knowledge some counselor and say where do you think the weakness in my application is and 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 if you apply and you don't get in yes you can try to call the institution and you're going to get a vague answer much like the one i'm giving you now because i can't say like i didn't let you in specifically because of this because what if you fix that and you still don't get in and he said well you told me if i did this that i was going to get in well that's not what i said at all um and, and so <clears throat> we're specifically vague and and we also can't have like a thousand kids calling us why they didn't get in because we just don't have the manpower for it but 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 that's what career counselors are for and and um uh and not blogs um someone asked if my mcat is not until june should i still send my application with a pending score yes This is uh, the link that I'm putting in. This is the link that I'm putting in um, in the chat. Is if your school doesn't have an advisor, the NAAHB has people that volunteered, and some of these people are like, uh, I know, like one of them is like an admission person at uh, at a school of dentistry, I think, who used to do, uh, who used to work for a medical school, but he's not doing. Um, so there's a lot of good people. Like I looked at some of these people and they're actually like very reputable people that volunteer their time because they think it's important and not every person has those opportunities. And so definitely check that out. Uh, it's a, it's free. You don't have to pay them. And just because you pay something doesn't mean it's better. So if it's free, use the free option. Yeah, I highly encourage that because as I said, some of these kids obviously don't understand why they didn't get in and, and they got like an 85th percentile on their MCAT and then they didn't get in and it's, and then they think, Oh, it was my MCAT. And then they go in and they get an 87th percent on their MCAT. Well, they wasted all that time and energy and money when it wasn't the MCAT, it was something else in their application and they didn't have the insight uh, or, or, you know, God forbid it was, you know, your interviews that flubbed you. Um, so you know, these people can help you say, well, no, your application looks perf perfectly fine. And they 
should be asking about like, well, how'd you do on your interview, you know? Um, another common thing is asking like, what is the cutoff for how far in the past could I include letters of recommendation and also like achievements? Like if I got them six years ago, is that still viable for my application? Or in anything, school? yeah, anything that, that happened in college is fine. Listing things in high school doesn't really help you. Um, uh, and letters, we prefer that you get fresher letters. I mean, if it's kind of like a research thing or a class thing, it is what it is. But um, uh, if you volunteered 20 years ago, then, and you got a letter from that person, that probably not so meaningful. Um, so, so yes, do try to keep fresh, but I do understand that if you took your bachelor's degree five years ago and you wanted to include something in there because you already got that letter, that's perfectly fine. But remember you got five or six, if you're pushing it, and I don't necessarily want all of them from your academics. I want some of them of like, what, what have you, you know, what have you done for me lately? Another is, question is, sorry, go ahead, Jivan. Oh, this is my favorite one. And, and, and this is something that, um, how many hours of shadowing volunteer and research do you need to have? There is no one answer. Uh, I already mentioned it. Like, we're not even really sure. Like, I, I, if I had to throw something out there, anything less than about 500 hours, it's kind of like, hey, um, now, does that mean that 2000 hours is necessarily a lot, lot better? Um, maybe, maybe not. Depends on what the context is in the rest of your application. So, again, uh, it, it's a holistic thing, it's not any one factor. But if I had to throw a number out there for something, give me 500 hours. This is this is my favorite one too, which you and I, but so if you say that you volunteer 200, 2000 hours in the ER, what is that considered? <laughs> Good for you. Yes. It's, it's considered a lot of hours. Did you do it consistently over a couple of years? Did you? Uh, and by volunteering, does it, did you volunteer passing out, uh, blankets and giving water or did you actually get in there and get your hands dirty? <laughs> so it's not just that you did it, it's the quality of it. Um, and, and, but if you're asking, is that enough? Yeah, it's enough. We have a talk coming up about volunteering, um, uh, shadowing clinical experience coming up. Um, you should come to that because uh, it's going to be a two-hour talk. So, and then you could ask a lot of those questions and yeah. examples. By the way, shadowing. I discourage it um, in the sense that if that's the only thing you're doing, it's not going to get you very far on the application. Um, it is no substitute for actually getting your hands dirty, like I said. Um, I mean, it's fine. It's dandy. It shows you had an inkling that you needed to start being aware of what you're getting yourself into. Please don't get a letter from the shadower. I like I full disclosure. I have kids shadowing me all the time. I'm very user friendly and my poor assistant pulls her hair out trying to coordinate the schedules and the paperwork that's required. And I don't mind doing it, and I and I and I'm an extrovert, so I don't mind talking to this extra person um, and chit chatting with them and, and giving pearls along the way, as as well as letting them see what I do. But but it's kind of like the B side of the menu, right? It's kind of like that extra vegetable that you have to order that nobody really wants, but you got to order it anyways. I mean, that's how we see the the shadowing. So don't rely on that to get you like, oh, I did a thousand hours of shadowing, like which nobody's going to do, but, but you know, it's usually on the order of 50, 60, a hundred hours, whatever. Um, and, uh, but uh, it, it's not going to get very far as what I'm saying. Don't, don't rely on that for your clinical exposure. Um, another question, does UCI accept prerequisites from community colleges? I don't care where you got them from. That, that is a yes. 
<laughs> I just because because the question will be posted, so you know. Yeah. Yes, that is that is a yes. Like it doesn't matter where you got them as long as you got them and as long as it is some legitimately accredited school. Uh, another one was was the five hundred hours you mentioned total or per activity. Yeah, yeah, that and that's how we start getting down this rabbit hole, right? That's why I don't want to give numbers, and that's what I'd like. I will go back to what I said before. I would prefer that you do one long term activity as opposed to twenty little short activities. Take that with a grain of salt. Um, um, does your PI uh, or other medical schools filter applications by MCAT, GPA, or both, or other things as well? <clears throat> Computer-based formula based on your GPA and your MCAT. Uh, what makes UCI Medical School unique, and why did you choose to work at UCI? Um... I don't know how unique it is, but the thing, the, 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 what I like about UCI that's kept me here for, oh God, when did I show up? 16 years ago. Um, when is you, when you were five, right? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. You're my new best friend. Um, is um, there's a certain sense of like, and again, interpersonal skills, like everybody really actually gets along. I can reach out to my own colleagues as well as colleagues from other specialties, there is a sense of, of we're all in it for the same purpose and we have a good attitude doing it. And we, we actually hang out with each other outside of work. There's a collegiality. In other words, I've been into, into institutions where it's all dog eat dog and competitive. And like, I was in like seeing divisions where like people, the partners weren't even talking to each other. And I'm like, what the heck kind of working environment is that? Some people thrive on that attitude not for me. Um, and, and, and even for the med students, you see it amongst them is, is there's a sense of collegiality and, and, and they're in it together. Um, and, and there's no quote unquote competitiveness and like, and, and actually going as far as sabotaging each other so that they can be better so that they can be the one that gets the spot. There is enough space at the table for everybody. It is not, I, I tell people, you know, people in, in our current environment, just like it's a zero sum game, right? There's only one chair for one person. And, and that's not the case. You just make the table bigger um, and you put more chairs on it. And so there's room uh, as long as you're qualified, obviously, you're perceived to be qualified. So um, I, I can reach out, I can call people, I can pick their brains, I can, I can hang out with them. Uh, and, and that's one of the things I really, really, really like working at at UCI. I mean, I came from a place where the attendings wouldn't talk to the interns, let alone anybody else. I mean, they would only talk to the chief. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I, you're not that important, dude. I'm sorry. At the end of the day, as much as I'd like to feel how important I am, I am totally uh, dispensable. And, and you know, you know, hopefully after 16 years, they won't dispense with me too easily. But 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 the point being that that nobody is that good that they can't talk to somebody else or that they have to have intermediaries. and and um, like I've had medical students that have my phone numbers. I've had residents, you know, all the residents have my phone numbers. Like, you know, I have colleagues from other departments, like, and, 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 and I can reach out and I'm kind of like old school in the sense that like, I, I think it's harder for you to say no face to face or with a real conversation as opposed to a text or an email or, or through the, the, the electronic medical record. So I'll pick up phones when I want something and I'll talk to them. And, and, and so that's the interpersonal skills part. Um, and, and, you know, to be a patient advocate. And so, um, anyways, yeah, I could go on and on, but that that's, that's essentially one of my big draws at UCI. That, and they give me plenty of leeway, but again, it's part of my job description to do all of the other things that are of importance to me. What do I do in my spare time when I am not doing things medical? And I, I say that a little facetiously because I, I have time to go do my medical mission work, um, but I also have time to go, you know, I have plenty of time for vacation. If I have something that I really, really, really want to do in terms of a musical performance or theater or whatever, <clears throat> I can get my colleagues to help me, like we'll switch out days so that we, so that it can get done. So there's a willingness to help each other out for our own wellness. As I mentioned at the very beginning, I look like this to this morning because 
I went, I went to go do my yoga. And as, as I become older, wellness becomes a thing for me that I used to kind of ignore, um, that I, that I, uh, now take much more seriously and encourage other people to, it's not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of, if I burn out, then I'm not going to do anybody any good, including myself and my family and my patients. So I do it almost a little bit of, you know, selflessly, like make sure that I'm up and running at hundred percent, providing the care that my patients need by taking care of myself. Uh, another question is if there was one piece of advice you could give to first generation uh, non-traditional students, what would it be? Keep plugging away and, and ask for advice. Call people, write people, email people, harass people, annoy people. I don't care. Um, keep plugging away because um, I got terrible advice early on in my careers and I struggled a little bit because of it. Made me the person I am today. And, and how would it have been different if, if I had not gone through that? Probably a little bit smoother. Might it necessarily have been better? I recommend. Oh, so one of my things is I just, <clears throat> I love movies. I can relate everything to a movie. I recommend go watch, if you have nothing better to do, Sliding Doors, old movie. Um, and the whole point of the Sliding Doors is that the the, the principal character went, goes to go on a subway and in one reality gets past the Sliding Doors and gets on the subway. On the other reality, the Sliding Doors close and doesn't get on. And then the two lives diverge on the movie screen and both lives, one way or the other, are depicted. And the whole lesson to that movie is, is things are not what it seems and i know our society these days are obsessed with fomo uh don't do fomo it is a waste of your time and energy and and positive vibes uh your life was uncool people what is fomo like me <laughs> fear of missing out no i guess i missed that <clears throat> so um which, by the way, a modernized version of that, if you want to go modern on me, is Everything Everywhere All at Once from this last year. So uh, brilliant movie. I hope it gets some Oscar nominations. Um, so, but but anyways, be persistent. Show grit. Uh, but But do what I didn't do, which is go out and ask questions. And if the answer doesn't sound right, go find somebody else. And, and, and. Um, and don't be afraid, like, you're not, if you butt hurt somebody because you're like, oh, well, I need a second opinion. Well, then that person is in it for themselves and not for you. So you have to be your own best advocate. You have to have as much information. You guys have access to so much more information than I had when, when I was a student. So th that's my advice to you. Get as much information as you can be persistent, um, and, and go harass people in a nice friendly way uh for for as much information as you can get and if their answer is they don't know then just really straight up ask them like well can you help me find somebody who does know uh so i i don't pick no for an answer very well even at my stage in my career so that's my advice to you the only thing that i would add is that you're not alone and there's other people that do it don't do it on your own rely on a community and show up like you're showing up on a saturday morning to do this, uh, to hear someone who who does this and get advice directly, I think that's I think mm -hmm. that's really important. Um, and you know, there's a lot of good free things out there. You don't need to pay ten thousand dollars to apply to medical school, which that's another big thing that's coming up now. Is that people say that you have to pay consultant to get into medical school? Yeah, don't don't. That is, and and I know it's have the time or their parents have the money uh to have somebody help them write their application or have somebody review their application i'm like yeah you know what that's fine and dandy but not necessary at all someone wanted to know um would it would you recommend quantifying the impact of our research in our personal statements Quantifying, no. Qualifying, yes. Why was it meaningful for you? What did you learn from it? What What do you think is the impact of it? Um, that That's really more what I'm looking for. Again, not so much that you did it as, as what do you think was the meaningfulness of it, either to you or to the world in general? 
Um, someone wanted to know if it looks bad or if um, volunteering related to dentistry is good for an application. Don't care. Did you volunteer? Did you spend a lot of time doing it? Did you have to interact with a lot of people? The other thing is working as a dental assistant, you can make really good money. It's like 24 Seriously. bucks an hour in California. So that means that if you're working for $15 an hour versus 25 bucks an hour, do the 25 bucks an hour because you will make more money in less hours. But at some point, leverage your dentist because I, I'm pretty sure your dentist knows a doctor and just get some shadowing time with the doctor. Leverage that because doctors and dentists and lawyers all know each other. I think it's like a secret society. Um, although doctors and lawyers, you know, that's a whole separate thing. But no, but just leverage that and just get a little bit of FaceTime with them. And that should be fine. I mean, yeah. God, dental assistant, like 25 bucks an hour. It's pretty good gig. It's not chump change. Um, can a bad letter of recommendation or a good letter of recommendation have a good weight on my application? Uh, yeah, we talked about that before. The letters of recommendation, how to get a good one, because that does help. A bad one will sink you. Um, and, and again, that goes back to what I said before. Make sure that that person seems enthusiastic about writing that letter for you as opposed to going, eh, okay, fine, I'll write you a letter. Mm, sketch. This is something that I answered in the chat, but I want you to just touch up on it, that the entire application is your primary application, secondary interviews, letters are like these are all part of your application you're not going to just get an admission after your primary application or after your secondary that's the whole application yeah no you're going to have to go through the interview process and um then after that everything's going to be highly scrutinized by a committee <clears throat> um do school ties play a factor in admissions do like if I went to this undergraduate institution, does it yeah, improve? I don't know how many times I have to tell you, I don't care where you came from. As long as it is a accredited. accredited. Yeah. <laughs> it's not your mom. Somebody asked this question was how, how does it impact your, you know, pre-transfer? So if you go into community college for two, three years, research all that different stuff how does it impact it not at all so the only thing is i would say that if you're at a community college for three years and if you're just going to school and that's it like that's gonna what did you do like you're giving up three good years you're in a community you know volunteering you know there's hospital there's all of these different so there's a lot of things the only thing you can't do at a community college is research but we've also done like three or four things about summer programs and research, clinical, and these pay, like some of these research programs pay you seven grand, 10 weeks. That's like 20 bucks an hour. So instead of like, you know, you know, working at Starbucks, which, you know, it's a good place to work, go do research and get paid 20 bucks an hour and get your housing and everything else. And we've <clears> done <throat> five or six sessions on those. There's also the HCC, so there's all of these opportunities. Don't think it's research, but there is now a lot of, and there's actually now some unique programs at UCI, UCLA, for community college students to be involved through research and other things. And so there's a lot of things you could do and don't just wait, you know? Well, but that that that's two separate issues, right? Like, again, the first part of the question, stop beating yourself over the head with like, oh, I came from this, community college or not like if you met all of the requirements for your gpa and it was accredited i don't care at all where you came from but then the separate thing is as you mentioned it's like did you do all the activities to go along with it right because the only problem like as you mentioned some of the community colleges they don't have the infrastructure for you to go out and, and you know help you go out and do volunteer things or medical things but that's on you right because i don't care if you went to harvard or I don't care if you went to Pomona Valley, um, if you didn't put in the extra time to go volunteer somewhere or uh, build a Habitat for Humanity, or, you know, then that's on you. I don't care if you went to Harvard and got a 4.0 and a 527 on your MCAT and then didn't do any activities. You're not getting in. 
But if you went to Pomona Valley and you volunteered for 2000 hours and, uh, you know, you worked at a hospice or you worked at a doctor's office scribing, then I'm much more likely to take that kid. So somebody asked the question, how do you find research opportunities as a minor pre-transfer student? And I think the only thing is that some of the rules are you have to be 16. Some of them pass waivers. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe you have that yeah. question. I, do, I personally don't take kids who are at least at the undergrad level um because i get kids wanting to shout at me when they're like 16 years old mostly because their parents are making them be overachievers but but uh my group will not do that um like you have to be at least 18 there's some paperwork her hoops to go through um and sometimes you just have to go find somebody right you have to knock on a, some doors you go google like oh I'm, I'm interested in pediatric neurology and you start googling pediatric neurology Orange County, for instance, if you're here in Orange County, and then you're going to find somebody, you may find somebody at chalk. And then you just hit those people up and say, Hey, can I come shadow you? But also I'm kind of sort of interested because I saw that you did research on X and I I'm kind of interested in that. And, and is there something for you? You're going to get some no's. I mean, I got a lot of no's when I was where I was at and, and uh, you know, where you're at, I should say. And, and, but all it takes is the one person to say yes. And sometimes if they, even if they say no, the follow-up question should still be, do you know anybody who does? And if they help you by giving you an answer, then they, then they served their purpose, even though they told you no. So, um, that's part of it, right? That's part of it. Did you do the footwork or did you lay down and, and give up when somebody said no, or did you keep at it until you found the yes? That's what I'm looking for. So there, there's something that I I think I'm going to trademark this. But anyways, you will get 100% no and reject it if you don't apply or you don't go for it. It's 100% fail rate. Now, if you're a minor and you apply somewhere and they reject you because of that, ask them, what can you do? Can you have letters of reference? There, there is some things that are legally like you can't beat the law unless you find a good lawyer, but that's like, but if you apply for a program and they say, we can't accept you because you're a minor, but they say, Hey, you know what? You're going to turn 16 next year. Why don't we have you come back next year or yeah. just have them say no, but there is, and, and that's just, <clears throat> it's, it's a legal issue. It's not that you're not worthy. It's not that you're not smart, but just apply and, and wait for them to say no. The other plug I'm going to make is come December 19th, because we have like, step-by-step -step things on how to do shadowing, some of the do nots and the do's. So, and this is not something we could explain in like two minutes and then you could, you know, it's a the whole process of when we're going to go over that during this talk when we have like a couple of separate speakers doing it. Um, but again, like just because you're a minor, it's, it's, you know, you obviously are, you know, smart enough, talented to, be a minor in college, which I think it's really, I mean, when I was 15, 16, I was not thinking about anything. So, but, um, but yeah, don't, don't let them turn you down. And, and then, um, yeah. And then that, that's pretty much it. I kind of just wanted to touch that on. Yeah. Um, anybody and, else have any other questions? Yeah. And to be honest with you? with you, if you're a minor, kind of like give yourself a little bit of time. It's okay. You know, take, take, take some time. And, and, and like I said, if it's pre- clinical stuff. It's not necessarily basic science, it's like basic science stuff. And then there's like, you know, medical legal issues and safety issues if you're in a lab and get hurt and all that kind of stuff. But, but if there's like data, um, I've worked with one or two. Um, but, but as you were saying, just be patient. You, you will one day not be a minor and it will be fine. Then one day you'll be old and you want to be a minor. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> Oh my God, if I could be 18 years old, knowing what I know today, I would kill the world. Um, <laughs> but that goes back to the FOMO, so which I said, don't do. Um, okay. well, any, anyways, well, I don't think we have any more questions. Uh, people wanted to thank you.